Hello, I'm straight, white and male. Not very fashionable, I know, but there's not much I can do about any of those three. However, if I wanted to identify into an oppressed class, a victim class, I could quite legitimately call myself working class. And that's what today's video is all about. Am I working class? Well, that's debatable. I'm not exactly a bricklayer. I write for a living. You could say I'm one of the laptop classes. But my background is extremely working class, so I could identify that way, you know. I was born into a poor part of the north of England with high unemployment. Uh, my dad was a manual labourer who was unemployed a lot of the time, went from job to job. His last job was as a lavatory attendant. So if I ever become famous, I can be known as the son of a toilet attendant. I live in a man's world. We were permanently short of money and you could say that all my influences were working class because I didn't know any middle class people, middle class in the British sense, not the American sense. Okay, there were teachers and doctors around, but I didn't know them as people. And I had a kind of stereotype view of the professional classes, largely from watching sitcoms. What's your offer? The same in real terms as you gave me at Sunshine Dessert. You drive a hard bargain, Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't change until I went to university at the age of 19. In the 1980s, when it was rare for someone like me to do that, and I was the first person in my family to go to university. So why am I saying all this? Well, I grew up in a time when progressive politics, left-wing politics, whatever you want to call it, was ostensibly focused on class, on economic circumstances, rather than identity politics, as it is now. And this was brought into very sharp focus today by something I saw on the Penguin Books website entitled Bog People Competition. Enter for your chance to have your fiction featured in a folk horror anthology. I've got to say I find this horrendously patronising, but see what you think. Holly Starling and Chateau and Windus are launching a competition for unpublished working class writers to have their fiction featured in a folk horror anthology. Bog People, a working class anthology of folk horror, will be published in autumn 2025 by Chateau. The book is the vision of Holly Starling, author of The Bleeding Tree, who runs Folk Horror Magpie online, and who will edit and introduce the anthology as well as writing one of the stories. Eight spaces will be taken up by established working class authors. It's important the publication reflects folk horror's messages of community and protest. So one slot is open for an unpublished writer from a working class background. They will be paid the same fee as all the other writers. Nice of them. Folk horror is many things. It's protest, vengeful spirits. It's a bit of Wicker Man, Midsommar or Jerusalem. But it's also the Peasants Revolt and maybe the 2011 London Riots. It's Robin Hood. It's the Lord of Misrule. With bog people, we assert a reclamation of this status as one deserving of reification. In its pages, we'll recognise the countless dead unnamed by the chroniclers of history. Stories of reaping and sowing, stories as sharp as a guillotine blade, stories that stand for all time. It goes on to say... All applicants must identify as working class or from a working class background. They must not have had their fiction or non-fiction published as a book. Well, that rules me out. Um, the closing date for entries is 16th of June, which is the day I'm recording this, so it's a bit late. But what do I think of this in general? Well, I'm kind of torn in a way. Uh, largely, I feel very patronised by it because what is... A working class writer? Is it something that is defined by upper middle class people as, you know, salt of the earth people in flat caps eating pie and chips and all this kind of stuff and leading miserable lives? Uh, because as I say, I, I identify as working class and I've done all sorts of interesting things with my life. I'm not a victim. I think that's the main thing. 
In about the year 2000, I was living in London and a friend persuaded me to do some uh, work on myself, as she put it. <laughs> Have you been talking to a bird? <laughs> Might have been. This was self-help, which was fashionable in those days, and I did a course in Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, which is based on the book by the American writer Susan Jeffers. A lot of that book, actually, and this is true for a lot of self-help, was about not being a victim. Whatever your circumstances might be, don't feel sorry for yourself. Do the best that you can in your life. Live the best life you can. And don't blame other people. I think that was a big part of it as well. And I kind of took this stuff to heart, but it's really out of fashion now, I've got to say. Because it seems as though a sense of victimhood is a, is a currency and that people who've had quite comfortable lives will manufacture, in some cases, a, a persecuted minority status for themselves. Now, I know that publishing is an extremely upper middle class industry, uh, but at the same time, I'm trying to be charitable and see where these people are coming from. And part of me can understand why, if you were a, perhaps a struggling writer or someone trying to get your break into the business, that you would um, go along with this and identify as part of the, a victim group. I couldn't do it because I think it's demeaning and I don't want to... I wouldn't want to play the role of the working class northerner, you know, in front of all these posh people in London. Crowd. Folk horror frequently offers incidental beauty. It is enraptured by nature. Most of all, it is concerned with a fear of outsiders and a clash of cultures. Oh, what is all this? I mean, you, you, you've got fake, fake, fake biology, fake religion. Sir, have these children never heard of Jesus? I see all this as a rather dreary kind of agitprop. And one of the things that leapt out at me as I was looking through this was the conflation of the Peasants' Revolt with the London riots of 2011. I was living in London at the time those riots occurred and it's kind of chilling to see them um, retconned as a good thing. It was a night of absolute madness and I was in a flat in Woolwich in South London that evening with a friend of mine who was a woman of colour and the only reason I mention that is because she was as horrified by the surrounding mayhem as I was, you know, it wasn't all black power and, you know, up the uh, the dispossessed people of London. It was nothing like that. It was a lunatics going on a rampage with a, a kind of political excuse to do so, or, a, or a, th a thin veneer of politics, you could say. So Tottenham went up in flames, at least one of the estates did, and uh, it's just been spreading ever since. Um, just young people looting shops, uh, just destroying things for the for the fun of it. The next morning, I went down into the centre of Woolwich. Very bad smell of smoke. And a shop that was owned by an Asian family had been completely burnt out. It was horrifying. The whole thing was horrifying. And as I say, to, to see it re-envisaged as some kind of um, political revolt on a par with the Peasants' Revolt, it, it, it's just amazing to me. You know, I don't want to pretend that George Orwell is some kind of political soulmate of mine who would agree with everything I think, because I think too many commentators try to get away with that sort of sleight of hand. But one thing that did attract me to his writing many years ago was that he recognised the phenomenon of posh people trying to get off on the suffering of people um, less advantaged than them. And it was true in his day in the 1930s when they all, they all professed to be socialists and to care about the people of Middlesbrough 
as uh, yeah, he puts it in one of his books. And these days I think we have a more uh, sophisticated version of that where um, the people of Middlesbrough have kind of been pushed aside in favour of other groups, um, be they, you know, racial or LGBT or whatever. And, and I, th I think it's equally as, as disingenuous um, on the part of the, the posh people, put it that way. The middle-class socialist enthuses over the proletariat and runs summer schools where the proletarian and the repentant bourgeois are supposed to fall upon one another's necks and be brothers forever, and the bourgeois visitors come away saying how wonderful and inspiring it has all been, the proletarian ones come away saying something different. Saviour complex, virtue signalling, call it what you will. I just don't think it's very healthy to pigeonhole people in this way. And rather than have a meritocracy to set up these patronising schemes, whether they're for so-called working class people, people who identify as working class, or, you know, or any of these other groups, I, I think we've gone backwards. Okay, a bit of a change from my usual whimsical videos about old films and TV, uh, but I'd be interested to hear what you think. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, Please like and subscribe and until the next time, bye.